That is an amazing thing, right? And when you sign up, God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to take you out of all your problems. I'm going to give you a life free from suffering, free from hardship. He doesn't say that. He just says, you're going to go through hard times like everyone else. As Christians, we're not immune from that. But one of the most incredible things is this, is that we get to flourish in life. That's his promise in every season, in the difficult seasons, in the really hard seasons, you can have peace and joy and love. You know, I've been a Christian 28 years now and over those 28 years, there's been one or two days where I have not experienced the peace of God in power in my life. As a daily thing, as, you know, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the peace of God. And I want to say to you that what I'm going to share today could change your life forever. This is what a Christian should look like. This is the fruit of a Christian. My question is this, what do you think about yourself? Do you actually like yourself? And Nelson's going to give me heaps. (laughs) This is a mirror. (laughs) This is Nelson's mirror. I borrowed it from him. (laughs) And, And pretty much we look at ourselves and the way that we see ourselves is the way that we live out life. True? If you, if you really deep down think about it, the way that we see ourselves is the way that we live out our life. And for some of us, we can think more highly of ourselves. <laughs> like if we're looking at our natural picture and go, oh, wow, I'm good looking and really you're not. <laughs> now, everyone's good looking here. It's just me that's not, right? <laughs> But you can look at, at yourself and, and, and think more highly of yourself or you could look at yourself and think more lowly of yourself. And largely your happiness, your contentment, your way of life is determined by the way that you see yourself, what you believe about yourself. And again, this is the Bible that I stole from Shona. It's, it's not, is it Nelson's? Or? <laughs> and and what the what the bible says james says that this bible the truth should be our mirror this should determine how we actually see ourselves he says hearers of the word and not doers of the word are ones that look into the mirror And at once forget who they are. But do as those who do the word of God are those who look at the perfect law of liberty, the truth. They filter things through the truth and then they see themselves differently and they walk it out. You you might hate yourself. The devil could have you thinking that you're worthless that you're bad, that people would be better off even without you being in, in this world. You could compare yourself with others to justify yourself. You can feel insecure, never thinking you're good enough and never experiencing lasting peace and joy and love. If I was to put a mirror up in front of you, what would you say about yourself? Well, today I want to say it doesn't matter what you say about yourself. It's what the Word of God says about you and what you believe. See, so you'll work out of them, that you'll manifest what you believe in your life. I can, I can tell you, if I spend a week with any of you, I could tell you what you really value in life. 
by the way that you spend your time and spend your money. Agree? Hey, this is what I truly value in life. This is, you know, you say you love your wife, but I'm not seeing that, right? If I, if I, I could just look at your life, I could see what you truly value. We live out of our value system. And so what we believe will be manifested in our life. That is so, so clear. That's why John, uh, Jesus says they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. It's knowing the truth about yourself that sets you free. It's not the fact that you've been born again that sets you free. It's not the fact that you, you're a new creation that sets you free. What sets you free is not the truth. What sets you free is knowing the truth about who you are now. So what, if you don't think very highly of yourself, what do you think about Jesus? Did he have it all going on? Is he good? Is he perfect? Did he, does he struggle? All those things, all those questions, what do you think about Jesus? Well, what about if I said to you that it's no longer who you... You li- it's no longer the, the blah, 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 blah. Let, let's do that over again what if I was to say, with, say to you that your old nature died with Christ you know when you were born again you've become a brand new creation that's obvious people see it all around you there's something different about this person but it's not until you read in the Bible that your old life died with Christ And that he took out your sinful nature and put in his spirit of righteousness that we actually understand what transpires when we give our life to Christ, when we're born again. We become brand new on the inside. And Paul puts it like this. It's no longer I who lives, referring to his old sinful nature, referring to him in his carnality, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. My old nature, that is gone. I shouldn't see myself as, as, you know, what I used to be. But now I see that God has put his spirit in me. And it's Christ's life, his nature that lives in me. Are you getting this? What if you began to look in the mirror and go, wow, I'm made in every way like Christ so I can live like him. God's taken out my desire to sin, my my sinful nature, this propensity towards sin. And he's put in me his spirit. He's put in his righteousness in me. He's put in the life of Jesus in me. That's why he calls it the spirit of Jesus. It's it's Jesus living within us. The Holy Spirit living within us. The spirit of Jesus living within us. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. If that becomes your reality, you go, oh. I can live differently. I can live differently. In Galatians 2, 19 to 20, it says, For I through the law died to the law, that I might live for God, live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God wants us to see ourselves like like we see Jesus and we go, hey, the perfect law of liberty is the new covenant. It's It's the New Testament. And when we look at that and we see the life of Jesus, we go, man, I can live like that. He is my example. I'm made in every way like him so I can live like him. That's why he said, come follow me. Come do what I did.
I'm going to, to speak today about how we're created so naturally to produce fruit. To produce love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control is what a Christian's life looks like. That's what defines us. That's what we're, what we're meant to live like. Full of love, full of peace, full of joy. You might know someone like that. You might know, you might, have, you might experience that for yourself. What I'm saying is this is your everyday nature. You're a new spiritual creation. This is what your new life looks like. It's, we just need to walk in truth to produce it. It's not like something that you've got to force to happen. It's not something like you've got to read the Bible or pray or do all these things to make this happen. It's just a natural byproduct of your life. All of these things happened to me and I had no clue that that's what was meant to happen to a Christian. When I, got, when I come to God, I got born again and it was so obvious, not only to myself, but to everyone else. And I, I, I went from being... Uh, you know, a rotten husband to actually being a loving husband. And, um, and my, my wife and I is nodding. <laughs> yes, that <I> was. Yeah. <laughs> or oh, you'll cop it when I get home. No. Just <laughs> <laughs> but but, that, but that, that, is what, that is what happened to me. I became joyful. I, I had this peace. And all of that happened... And I didn't try and do anything. I didn't try my hardest to be joyful. I didn't go out of my way to be loving. I didn't go out of my way to be patient or to exercise self-control. I didn't try and make these a virtue that I had to strive to get. It was just a natural byproduct of my life. And I, I didn't know that's what happened. I had no clue. It was about nine months later that I read in the Bible that these things happened. And I went, wow. All I knew is that I just felt amazing. It was euphoric. Like God's spirit living within me and changing me. And, and you know, the things, the changes that I wanted to see in my life for so long that I, I didn't experience suddenly were all happening. And I, I wasn't trying and I went to work and I told everyone at work and, and I think I was embraced because what I was doing wasn't self-righteous. It wasn't me trying to prove myself that I'm a good Christian and that I, I look the part. God just changed me on the insight and i become a, a good person. I must have been a, a rogue. I must have been horrible because I'd hear people talk about me in the corridors. Oh, have you heard what... It's happened to Lionel. And I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> he's, I'm going to get mocked. And they actually said, he's such a good guy now. Can you believe how good he is? <laughs> anyway. This is what you, your new life looks like. And I want to say this. That a vine, a tree, and a plant bears fruit in keeping with its kind. So you don't see an orange tree bearing lemons. And you don't see a lemon tree bearing oranges. An orange tree bears oranges. A strawberry uh, plant, strawberries. An olive tree, olives. You produce fruit after your own kind. That's why God says, this is the fruit of a Christian who is spirit-filled. This is their life. This is what it looks like. This is what they so naturally produce. They don't work at it. They don't strive at it. They don't have to do anything for it. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You're a new spiritual creation. You have a new divine nature. That is what's changed. Sometimes 
you know, it can be such a long time ago, 28 years, I forget what my old life was like now. But I can tell you that God puts his spirit within you to change you. And then he calls anything outside of your nature, anything else that you produce that's not according to his spirit, works. He calls them the works of the flesh, the works of our old way of life. Don't get me wrong, Christians can produce works. But I want to tell you and want to show you how easy it is to bear fruit. All you need to do is have a relationship with Jesus. Full stop. A relationship with Jesus. Full stop. Turn to your neighbor and say, a relationship with Jesus, period, or full stop. Nothing else. Nothing else added, just a relationship with Jesus, end of story. You don't have to work at producing the fruit. The fruit is a natural byproduct of a relationship with God. This is how your life looks. You don't have to read the Bible, pray, do all these things to produce this fruit. This fruit is fruit. It just comes out of a healthy relationship with God. Christianity isn't about performance. It's not about you trying to impress God in how good you can live as a human being here on this earth. So many Christians put themselves under the Bible like a mirror in the sense, like a measure. They look at themselves and how far, how, how far short they fall of the glory of God. They, they write themselves off. They say, look, I'm hopeless, you know, I'm whatever. And I want to tell you that the devil wants to steal your little lunch. <laughs> you know, as kids, how we had fruit for little lunch? For recess, we'd have an apple and we'd have a banana or whatever. The devil wants to pinch your apple or banana. <laughs> and so the way, that he, the way that he steals from us, the way that he, he gets us into a place where we're not bearing fruit or not enjoying the fruit, is to somehow... And he knows demons know you so well. They study your life. They know what ticks you off. They know exactly what buttons to press. They know exactly what to say to you to get you feeling worthless. So you don't see yourself the way that you were meant to see yourself. You see yourself far less than that. And when you see yourself far less than that, that's the way that you, when, where you live from. The devil's plan is just to get you, get you out of alignment with God's will. He wants to disturb your life. He wants to get in there and just tick you off with something. He wants you to feel shame and guilt and condemnation. F be overwhelmed with fear and worry and all those things so that you don't enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. These things should be so totally foreign to us. Fear and worry and, and, and discouragement and oppression, all of that should be so foreign to a Christian. What is your fruit? Your fruit is love and joy, and peace, and patience, and gentleness, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and self-control. If you find at any time during the day that you're not there, just say, okay, God, what led me to this point? 
What lie have I believed in? What, what am I hanging on to that I need to release to produce this fruit in my life? When you understand you can walk moment by moment in the peace of God and in the fruits of the Spirit, and that's just what overflows in your life, man, you don't want to live any other way. You go, no, I'm not having that fear come upon me. I'm not going to allow worry and anxiety about something come upon me. The devil, every time he, you know, he studies your life, the demons study your life, they go, okay, this is what's going to cause this person to stumble. I'm just going to put that there. I'm just going to bring a bit of discouragement your way. And when you understand that discouragement is usually coming from a demon, trying to make you, you feel less about yourself, and then you go, you know what, I'm not buying in to the lie. You see, just the natural byproduct of a healthy relationship with God produces the fruits of the Spirit. And this is... I've, I've declared all that and now I'm going to show you where it is in Scripture. The fruit of being born of God and being a new spiritual creation. This is Galatians 5, to 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. These things, these things are the natural byproduct of our life. This is what we should see moment by moment in our life. Where these new spiritual creations, what do we allow in to steal our, our fruit? What lies do we believe in that mean we don't get to enjoy this moment by moment? Fruit is naturally produced effortlessly and this is the true you. This is the true you. You don't have to try and love people better. Just be yourself. You don't have to try and manifest peace. Just allow, just be yourself. Allow God just to, just to you know, just press into God. You ever been really fearful or worried about something and then you prayed and you just got a peace when you put your trust in him? That's what it's like. You don't have to accept fear. You don't have to accept worry. You can go, God, you know what? You've never failed me yet. God, you've done it here. You've done it here. You've done it here. You're going to do it here. And even if you don't, I'm choosing not to worry because you're a good God. So how do you produce this fruit? And I want to say to you that you produce fruit through partnership with Jesus. Not you trying to show Jesus how good you are. Not by you reading the Bible and showing God, okay, well, I read the Bible today. I feel good about myself. Today, I, I, I prayed. I feel good about myself. No, feel good about yourself because you are good. You are made after the image of God in true holiness and righteousness. Live that way. See yourself the way that God sees you. See the way that, that, the, that you have been now created to live. And when you begin to own that, you begin to live it. In, in John 15, 1 onwards, Jesus tells a story about the vine and the branches. It's an agricultural story. He, he just says, I'm the true grapevine. Try and picture it. Jesus is the grapevine. My father is the gardener. And the gardener, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. God wants us to produce fruit, right? And he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit so that they can produce even more. Sometimes we go through difficult situations where God uses those situations to prune us to make us even more fruitful. You know, we go through difficulties and suffering 
and we can actually see God at work in our life going, okay, this is how I'm going to produce patience and self-control in you. I, I'm going to take you through some, some difficult times and these are going to mould your character so th- and strength so that you, you're, you're right for the way forward. He then says, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. And he says this, remain in me or abide in me. And I will remain in you. Remain in me. Do life with me. Partner with me. And I will remain in you. For a, a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Remaining in me just means to partner with me and do life with me. And not to remain in me means to live independently. We've all seen people that have come to Christ, had a revelation of his goodness. And then and then they're not following God anymore. Maybe you've been there and come back over the years. What God's saying is, you know, just remain in me and I will remain in you. And this is the promise. Verse 5, yes, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me intimately connected with him and I in them will produce much fruit. God wants to produce much fruit in us. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you see how trying to live a good and noble life might be honourable? And it's obviously our desire to do that. (coughs) But it's to do it with Christ, in Christ. Allow God to to have that intimate relationship with him and effortlessly go through life in walking in the fruits of the Spirit. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burnt. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Allow the word of God to to permeate you. Allow it to remain in you. Allow it to be your, your guide. Because I tell you, when the word of God's living in you, you don't want the things of this world. You want the things of God. Verse 8. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. You see, bearing fruit is a mark of a disciple. Bearing fruit is, is a mark of a disciple. It's so easy. It's effortless. It's just having a relationship with Jesus, abiding in him, remaining in him, allowing him to be number one in your life and just living that way. These things naturally follow you. It's not something you have to work at. Are you getting this? God has given us the nature of Christ so we bear the fruits of the Spirit. God wants us to bear much fruit. It's not like we've got to try to impress him to do it. And we do so by remaining in him. God is glorified when we do this. This is not about performing for God or to prove yourself to God. God wants this more than you do and we receive the fruits of the Spirit in partnership. If you think lower of yourself, if you think, like I actually hate myself, I feel like I'm so unworthy. Everyone else has got this thing going on, I'm struggling with it. That's just lies coming from the evil one and you've just bought into agreement with it. You come out of disagreement with that, see who you are in Christ. You'll produce the the fruits of the Spirit effortlessly. Verse 9 and 10. 
He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you abide, obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. The natural byproduct of our life is righteousness. We li- it's called the fruit of righteousness. And it's something that we so easily produce because that's our new nature now. It's something that we don't have to work at. And he said that you've died to the law. We're no longer under the law and we're no longer meant to be sin conscious. We're no longer meant to be going, okay, well, I can't sin. I, I must not sin. And I'm focused on trying to live right. No, just focus on your, your attention on having a relationship with Christ and you will live right. We, we see in, in, in Romans 7 that, that, that when people are sin conscious, when they're focused in on doing, not doing something, they do it all the more. You might have experienced that. Overcoming sin is, a, is an amazing thing. We're set free from it. We're no longer a slave to it. You want to walk free from sin? Just understand that you are new, that you are made like Christ. And your focus isn't on trying not to sin. Your focus is on a relationship with Christ, on, with intimacy with him. When you, when you understand that fear is no longer part of your DNA, when, when worry is not part of your DNA, when you understand that that's not being generated from you, but it's external and wants to come upon you, and when you see that and you see discouragement and all these other things coming against you, you can say, that's not part of who I am. You have no part of me. And this seems overly simple. But I tell you, those people, question those people that live this way. It's so simple. It really is that simple. We naturally bear fruit in a relationship with Christ and we bear much fruit, it says. John 15, 11, he says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Jesus is saying these things to you today. Don't hear it from me. Imagine that Jesus was here today and he's saying, would you get this? If you remain in me, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. And he's saying, I'm telling you these things that my joy, my joy, the joy that was in Jesus might be in you and it might be complete without lack, overflowing. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy. Most people want to be happy. Don't they? This is what people are pursuing in life. They want holidays because it brings joy, brings a degree of happiness. They want possessions because for a moment they feel happy. You know, all these things bring us a degree of happiness. But what God's saying is, what Jesus is saying is, I want to give you something way better than happiness. I want to give you this thing called joy, which is a spiritual gift. It's a spiritual fruit. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to work all week to to earn the money, to get it, to buy something, to get you that hit. I want to give it to you free of charge. I want to give you joy that's not that is not dependent upon things going well in your life. Yes, your joy will overflow. What you're searching for. If you don't know Christ, what you're searching for, if you're true, is, is happiness or a contentment or this sense of belonging, this sense of, I feel okay, this, this sense of love. It's called God. 
God will fulfill your greatest need. His desire is that you would know him, not just know about him, but you would be so full of him that your desire for other things would no longer be there. That God would just fill you with such a joy. He says, this is my commandment, that you'd love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Jesus did away with the law. And he gives us a command to love. God wants us to focus not on the law, not on the do's and don'ts, not on all the commands. He wants us to focus on this one thing, that we would love one another. What about if, if remaining close to God just involves us loving one another? What about if you don't sin if you love one another? <laughs> it's very hard to, it's very hard to, to steal against someone that you love. It's very hard to assault someone that you love. He said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. This is what God wants for your life. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command that you love one another. And I'm going to finish with these words. How do you bear much fruit that lasts? How do you remain in a relationship with God? And there's just three things. I just want you to focus on these three things. Would you just love God more than anything else in your life? Would you just choose to love him more than anything else? When you love God first and the most, you love everyone else better. <laughs> you take a, a Christian out of a relationship with Christ for a week and they're feral. <laughs> they're angry, they kick the cat, whatever else. We see this, you know, when we remain in Christ, when we have that intimate relationship with him, we remain in his love, we remain in, in, his, um, in his presence and we produce the fruits of the Spirit. But if I get offended against someone, say I get upset about someone, what happens? The devil gets to steal my lunchbox. He gets to steal my fruit. I get angry. Probably not with the person that I'm offended with. I kick the cat. You know, I'm angry. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not, I don't have any peace. That's why he says, if you keep my command, and his command is to love, if you keep your command, you'll remain in that place of love. It's when we, when we go after other things and love other things more than we love God. See, when you love God, you just want to spend time with Him. You want to pray to Him. You want to... <laughs> and believe it or not, it's when we understand that God loves us as we are and that God loves and we're good and we can come freely into His throne room of grace because we're his kids made like his son we don't have to think that we're less than we're actually we are who we we like we sang we are who you say we are we are free indeed and then love others the way that jesus loved his disciples that's going to help you to remain in his love and walk in truth and live according to your new nature. What we want to do is, is, is be able to look into a mirror. Through truth. And see who we are.
when we see who we truly are through truth, then we'll live that way. God has set you up to flourish in life, to be so incredibly fruitful and you don't have to work at it. All you have to do is to love God. All you have to do is to have an an intimate relationship with Him and as you have that intimate relationship with Him, you just produce the fruits of the Spirit. It's effortlessly, you don't have to work at it. You just have to be on guard of what you're not. And say, no way, I'm not having this. I'm not allowing this to come into my life. No, I'm not getting offended. No, I'm not getting whatever. No, I'm not having this fear. Amen. Awesome. Well, I'm finished there. Billy and Kyra could come up. I just, um, who's been enjoying worship this morning? Isn't it good? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, just want to give people the opportunity to actually respond. In order to produce the Holy Spirit in your life, you actually need to receive Christ. No matter how much I tried to be a loving husband, I miserably failed at it because I tried in my own strength without being born again. No matter how much peace I tried to get by getting going to quiet places to receive peace, it never lasted. But when God comes into your life, he changes everything. He puts his spirit in you. He cuts away the bad stuff, your sinful nature. He cuts that away and he puts Him, his, the spirit of Jesus in you. It's like Jesus living in you so that you can live differently. This is what he does. And it all starts by repenting and believing. It all starts with saying, God, I've had enough doing life my own way. But today, I want to do things your way. I want you to invite you into my life. Lord, I... I want, I want you in my life. I want to turn from living life for myself and I want to live for you. And when you do that, God fills you with his spirit. This first step might be a step of faith where you don't know whether God's real or not. You might have seen God in other people. That's what happened to me. I saw God in other people and I wanted what they had. And really what I wanted, what they had was what I've been speaking about, their fruit. I could see peace in them that I wanted. And if that's you, your first step of faith might be a bit blind, but I can tell you, once God comes in you, it's undeniable. God's real. (laughs) So if that's you today and you're, you're just fed up with doing life the way that you've always done it and today you want to make your peace with God, today you want to invite him into your life, would you raise your hand? Awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? A few people. You want to give your life to God. You want to say, No to the world and yes to God. And I tell you, he will come and he'll put his spirit in you so that you can live differently. Just just one, one last time, is there anyone else that would like to give their life to Christ? Before I finish up right now, anyone else? Okay. Awesome. Could I just get those people that have raised their hand just to do something bold and to come out the front? Would that be all right? 